This is DC Lesson 3, Part A, and we're looking at Ohm's Law. So, about this lesson. In this lesson, we're going to explain resistance and its effect on current. We're going to look at some explanations around what is Ohm's Law. And the way we do that, or the basis of the lessons, is our textbook and it's sections 3.1 resistance and conductance and 3.2 ohms law so resistance and conductance resistance is the opposition to current flow and i will introduce you to a little metaphor that uh, describes that but that's the basic definition resistance is that which opposes current flow and we use it or sorry we measure it in ohms named after George Ohm an English physicist and we also use the symbol capital R so measured in ohms and we use Omega and the symbol we often use is capital R conductance is a measure of the ability of a conductor to carry electrical current. It's the exact opposite to resistance. It's measured in Siemens, again, named after a German physicist. And it uses the symbol capital G. And as I mentioned just a moment ago, it is the reciprocal or the mathematical opposite of resistance. So we can simply say that R is 1 on G in ohms and conductance is 1 on R in Siemens. So that's the mathematical relationship. They are the direct inverse of each other. So what is a conductor? We need to understand a little bit of subatomic physics. And if you haven't already cottoned on, Electrical current is all about electrons, the flow of electrons from one atom to the next. Now this atom we have here on the screen is a copper atom. It has 29 electrons orbiting the nucleus and has one loosely bound electron out in the outer valence shell. But even though it's in the outer valence shell, to make an atom move, so we'd make an electron move between atoms, it actually still takes energy. So flow, when it comes to conductance and resistance. In a conductor, electrons can easily move from one atom to the next because of its low valency. But they're not free. Even with low valence or low energy levels, when an electron is forced from one atom to the next, it actually takes a little bit of energy. And this energy requirement, or the struggle to move, is called resistance. So electrons resist. Even though they're in the outer element, or the outer valence of an electron, they still take a bit to move them from one atom to the next. And that's what results when we see resistance. So to give you a bit more of an explanation, I've taken the best conductor that we know about, and that's silver, and it has a resistivity. I'll just turn my, my pointer on. So this is silver up here, and it's the best conductor, and it has a resistivity of 1.58 ohms to the meter times 10 to the minus 8 so tiny tiny bit of resistance and you'll notice that there are five energy levels so if you look at the energy levels that's them here there's one two three four and number five so silver is a good conductor because this outer electron is easy to drag out not free but easier than say copper copper is the next best conductor and again it has an electron here in one of the outer valences 
but it's number four. You can see here one, two, three, and there's four. So again, it has an electron, copper, that is loosely bound, but not as loose as silver. So copper takes a little bit more energy to get those electrons flowing. And then let's look at another con conductor, something like uh, aluminium. It's actually a poor conductor in comparison to silver and copper. And it has a resistivity of 2.65, almost or not quite double that of silver. And again, you'll notice that there are one, two, three energy levels. So again, aluminium has these electrons, but because they're at the third energy level, they're even harder to get these electrons to jump from atom to atom. And it's these energy levels and the requirement of using that energy to move the electron from atom to atom, therefore gives us silver being the best conductor, copper being a good conductor, and something like aluminium is a reasonably poor conductor. All because our electrons are stored within the actual atom at different energy levels. So what are some of the uh, symbols we use for resistors? And you can see here a fixed resistor. We often just use a rectangle and a uh, axial, it's called the axial piece of wire at either end. Sometimes we might use a zigzaggy shape. It's a more traditional. For a resistor that's variable, we add these arrows. So the arrow indicates that we have a third leg that's adjustable. So those are variable resistors. So we have a resistor symbol and how a resistor is depicted in the circuit. Here we're using the rectangular form or this form here because that's nice and easy to reproduce where the older traditional shape of the zigzaggy line indicating resistance is a little bit harder to draw etc in word processing programs and things the like. So let's now move on to Ohm's law itself. Ohm's law combines three fundamental electrical quantities. And these quantities are what we're really, really interested in. Now we're going to be talking about Ohm's law and it's a mathematical representation of the physics. I can't overstress that we're thinking about the physics, but what we call Ohm's law is just a mathematical model or representation of what the physics is doing. So we need to understand what voltage, current and resistance do in relation to each other as it applies to electrical physics. So voltage uses the symbol capital V and it's measured in volts. So V and volts are, by the way, named after Andreas Voltaire. Again, another French physicist. Current has the symbol I. And we use a capital A because it's measured in amperes. Again, named after Andreas Ampere. Resistance has the symbol R and is measured in ohms and we use the Greek symbol omega. That's what you can see here. This is the Greek symbol omega. Now I want to just point out to you at this time there is a fourth part to Ohm's law and that's power and we use the capital P 
just so you can be aware of that. But it won't be critical to you at the moment. Just want you to be aware. So you've got to remember that Ohm's law is just an algebraic modeling system. This is what we call the Ohm's law wheel. And you can see here in the center of the wheel, we have current, voltage, and resistance. So I've circled the ones that we're interested in at the moment. And let's start with current. So if we know what the, if we have the current and we want to find out what the current is, it's voltage divided by resistance. So what we're saying here is that current is proportional to voltage and inversely proportional to resistance. Therefore, that's the mathematical relationship I equals V on R. Voltage, let's look at volts now, the orange one. Volts is equal to the current multiplied by the resistance because both voltage, or sorry, both current and resistance are proportional to voltage. If the current goes up, then the voltage must have gone up. Or if the, the current must have gone up. And for resistance, if the voltage goes up, then the resistance must have gone up. So either one or the other has gone up, or both have gone up. And if the voltage goes down, it must mean that the current's gone down, or the resistance gone down, or they've both gone down. So we say that voltage is directly proportional to both current and resistance. And then finally, our ohms. R is equal to the voltage divided by the current. So, resistance is proportional to voltage, but inversely proportional to current. So if current goes up, resistance must have gone down, or if current goes down, resistance must have gone up. That's the physical relationship. And that's the part that I want you to concentrate on, that we're interested in the actual relationship between the physics of voltage, resistance, and current. Now here we have a nice, what I think is a nice visual metaphor. So we can use algebra on the right hand side. You can see our algebra. We can say voltage is equal to the current multiplied by the resistance. Or we can say the current is equal to the voltage divided by the resistance. Or the resistance is equal to the voltage divided by the current. They are the three basic Ohm's law equations. And just above them, you can see what we call the Ohm's law triangle. But let's concentrate on the visual metaphor, which we've used in a couple of other lessons. Despite uh, voltage being on the top and being in red, the actual most important part of Ohm's law is Mr. Amp. He is the most important part. So Mr. Ampere is what is flowing through our conductor. He is the item that is doing the work. Voltage or potential difference is how much force, how hard, I'll represent that by multiple arrows. So voltage is more like the force. Or how hard the current is being pushed through the conductor. And then the conductor itself, depending on its construction, how many loosely bound electrons it's got, whether it's silver, 
copper or maybe aluminium. That's Mr. Ohm. So Mr. Ohm offers restriction. He restricts the current. Therefore, Mr. Ohm offers resistance. Mr. Amp is the flow of electrons bouncing through the conductor. And Mr. Volt is how much force is being applied to Mr. Current to get him through the conductor against Mr. Ohm. So that is Ohm's law, and I find the visual metaphor a good way to think about Ohm's law. So here we're using an analogy, a water analogy, to also describe Ohm's law. So water flow is directly proportional to water pressure. So you can see here on our gauge, we've got low pressure here. With low pressure, we end up with low flow. So the pump is creating some pressure. The water is being sucked up into the pump. And it's at low pressure. We have some resistance in the pipe caused by friction. And then we have a low water flow. If we up the pressure or the voltage, which is the metaphor that we're looking at, you can see here on the right hand side, the voltage or the pressure has increased tremendously. The resistance hasn't changed. It's the same size pipe, but the flow has increased dramatically because the amount of pressure applied has increased. So what about flow and resistance? So again, using our little analogy here, this time we're going to keep the pressure the same. So look at our two pressure gauges. They're staying the same. So effectively the voltage being provided by our pump is remaining constant. But we've changed the diameter of our pipe. So you can see here the diameter of our pipe is quite small. In this one the diameter of the pipe is quite large. So small diameter offering high resistance, larger diameter offering low resistance. So here resistance is high and our flow is low. Over here our resistance is low but our flow is high. So our water flow is inversely proportional to the resistance offered by the pipe. And it's the same with our electrical circuit. So flow, current, so if you can imagine, I'll use the letter I. Here's our current. We've got large resistance, so Resistance is high, and I'll use an arrow in the up direction to indicate high resistance and low flow. So you can see the arrows move in opposite directions, indicating they are inversely proportional to each other. Over here, our resistance in this case is low, low resistance. But our current has high flow. We'll indicate with an up arrow to indicate high flow. So again, you can see the two arrows are in opposite directions representing what the water is doing, which is an analogy for what current and resistance offer each other. So the relationship we're looking at is water flow representing current and the diameter of the pipe being our analogy for resistance. So we can say that 
are is inversely proportional to current. That's how we would do it mathematically. We would say R is inversely proportional to current. And if we wanted to transpose the equation, we can also say that current is also inverse to R. That's the actual physics. So therefore, because water pressure is equivalent to voltage and water flow is equivalent to current, we simply say the current is directly proportional to voltage. In other words, I is proportional, that little symbol that we've been using there. This little symbol here just means proportional. So current is proportional to voltage. Current is inversely proportional to resistance. So to put it, those things together in the what we would call the Ohm's law format of actual algebra, we would say that I is equal to volts divided by R. So we simply changed our inverse our, sorry, our proportional symbol, put the equal sign in, combine the two relationships, and we end up with Ohm's law for current. The reason we call it Ohm's law for current is simply because we've made current the subject of the formula. So that's why we say Ohm's law for current, because we've made current the subject of the Ohm's law formula. Where current is in amperes, voltage is in volts and the resistance is in ohms. So here's a little example of how we can use Ohm's law to find current. So in this particular circuit we have a value of 10 ohms. I've got my pointer indicating the 10 ohm resistor. We've got a voltmeter connected across our resistor indicating 12 volts. And we'd like to work out what the current is, I, which is the red arrow here. So that's the circuit diagram arrangement. The connection diagram arrangement over here, what they call the actual circuit, is we have a 12 volt battery we have a resistor across it and we want to know what the current is that's flowing since they've told us that we have a 10 ohm resistor. So the values we have in the circuit are 10 ohms and 12 volts. We simply use the ohms law formula that we've just learned about with current as the subject. So I equals V on R. So in this particular case, we're going to have 12 volts divided by 10 ohms and that's going to give us 1.2 amps sorry yeah 1.2 amps which is what's being displayed here on the voltmeter the center being 1 and 2 volts being the full scale so 12 divided by 10 giving us 1.2 Amperes. So if we want to use Ohm's law to find other values, we've just got to learn how to uh, transpose the equation. So here's our original equation with current as the subject of the formula. And if we want to uh, change the subject of the formula, and let's say we want to make V the or voltage the subject of the formula. Then we simply multiply both sides by R. 
So I times R on one side and R on the other side. So we've multiplied by R here and we've multiplied by R here. This effectively puts R on R. So the reason we can strike these two out is that R divided by R equals 1 and anything multiplied by 1 is itself. So the R's eliminate themselves and we simply end up with I times R equals volts and then we just rewrite that to put the voltage on the left hand side in our traditional way of writing down the algebraic expression that volts equals the current multiplied by the resistance and of course voltage is now the subject of the formula. So Ohm's law for voltage as we've just said we're now making voltage the subject of the formula so voltage equals current multiplied by resistance you'll notice that there is no times symbol in the middle with algebra if there is no symbol or no operator it's called between the current and the resistance then it's automatically assumed to be multiplication so in this case V is the voltage in volts I is the current in amperes and R is the resistance in ohms so again let's do another quick little example this time we're looking for the voltage across the resistor we know the current through the resistor because we've got an ammeter telling us it's 1.2 amps and again we have a 10 ohm resistor so the values we're playing with is R is 10 ohms and the current is 1.2 amps therefore to find the voltage we simply will need this ohms law expression the voltage is equal to the current multiplied by the resistance so 10 multiplied by 1.2 tells us that there is 12 volts being dropped across the resistor so that's where our voltmeter is indicating at just over 10 giving us 12 amps So now let's change or take that formula and make resistance the subject of the formula. So again, we want to find resistance. So we take our voltage equation that we've just been using and we're going to mold, sorry, we're going to divide both sides by I. So here's our I being divided through on both sides. Again, I divided by I divided by I of course equals 1 and anything times 1 is itself so effectively the I's cancel each other out and we're left with voltage divided by current equals resistance and then we just simply rewrite that so that on the left hand side we have the subject of the formula being resistance our R equals voltage divided by current Again, this is just a modeling system that represents what the physics is doing. So, Ohm's law, and this time with a little example. So, it's Ohm's law for resistance only because we have made resistance the subject of the formula. Where I is the current in amperes, V is the voltage in volts, R is the resistance in ohms. And again, just a, a quick little example as we work through that. So this time, we don't know what the resistance is. Well, we kind of do because we're using the same numbers, aren't we? We know that the current is 1.2 amps. We know the voltage is 12. And again, 
we've got a volt meter here connected in parallel reading out 12 volts we've got an ammeter connected in series measuring out 1.2 amperes so the values we have for the circuit 12 volts and 1.2 amperes using our Ohm's law for resistance equation which is this one here R is equal to the voltage divided by the current so 12 divided by 1.2 tells us that the resistance value is 12 ohms we can use the ohms law triangle quite a handy way to do it because it's nice and easy to remember so this is the Ohm's law triangle and we quite often give this to you on your equation sheets and things uh, of the like and simply by putting your finger or covering up the term that you want to find gives you the formula so if you want to find voltage just cover up the volts and it's I times R if you want to find out the current I cover up the current and you get voltage divided by resistance and then finally if you want to find the resistance cover up the R and its volts divided by current so don't be fooled again uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, the Ohm's law triangle and quite often the way we write Ohm's law because it's nice and easy to remember this one this is the one that everyone seems to remember easily voltage equals the current multiplied by the resistance and the triangle has voltage at the top but let me assure you that the important part to remember as far as the physics go is this guy here Mr. Ampere he is the guy who does all the actual work so as current goes through a circuit whether the circuits designed to produce heat a magnetic field or a chemical reaction it is mr. amp who does the work mr. ohm tries to restrict him and mr. volt is the force or the pressure by which mr. amp is being pushed or forced through the circuit and remember Mr. Ohm is just the relationship of the material that the atoms are made up of for here if it's got lots and lots of loose electrons in the outer ring we've got plenty of loose electrons out here it's going to be a good conductor but if the electrons are tightly bound in here close to the nucleus then they're a very poor conductor and sometimes they can be so poor we call them an insulator so that brings us to the end of DC lesson 3 part A I hope you've enjoyed learning a little bit more about electrical physics